Hello everyone, welcome to Blitz Chess number 26. In today's video I'm going to play a Blitz game, I'm going to walk you through what I think, and your job as a viewer, your job, is to pause the video from time to time, maybe wonder what would I play in this position, and that way we can all learn. So we're playing as Gabriel, we're playing with the black pieces, and we're going to respond e4 with e5. Seems like we have a double king spawn, knight of 3, probably white is going to play either the Spanish, the Italian, or the Scotch, sorry, the Scotch. Oh my goodness, the scotch. Which are the most popular openings with e4, e5, knight of 3, knight c6. But white decides to play bishop b5. If you remember, 10 seconds ago I said this is the Spanish. And in the Spanish I have many ways of playing. I was playing blitz games recently where my opponent went a6 and after bishop a4, which is the main line, my opponent went d6 followed by f5. Now, I failed to study that. When you're playing chess, you should study the openings that come to your to your games, analyze your games. So given that I haven't su studied that, I'm going to go ahead and play something that I have been aware of, or I have been, uh, I have studied before, I should say, sorry, which is 9GE7. What this is doing is I'm intending to develop my bishop by fianchetto. Fianchetto is when you push the pawn from G7 to G6 and bishop G7 or B6, bishop B7, as long as you're moving one of these pawns. That's a fianchetto. White castles, very logical, I'm going to play g6 now. I'm intending to play bishop g7. And once I finish development, which is what you should do in the first place when you're playing in the opening, I think I can start thinking about what plans should I go for. Or should I, should I, go, should I go for an attack? Or should I, should I defend? Should I play for the end game? All of these things. Now bishop g5, g5 is a clever move by my opponent. This is kind of claiming that f6 is going to be difficult to achieve, first of all. Bishop f6 is a problem. And I have to play bishop g7, because if not, bishop f6 would be a problem, as I said. So bishop g7 I, have to, I had to play. My opponent plays c3 now. And I don't know if you remember this, but let's rewind a couple of moves. White went d4, and after e takes d4, bishop g5. So white did not capture back. Which means that after bishop g7, all of a sudden, white sacrifices a pawn. Because white did not capture back, as logical as that. Now, is this good news for me? It depends. If white has enough compensation for the pawn, meaning if white has enough play to compensate for the lack of a pawn, then it means I'm probably going to have to defend at some point. But if white is just bluffing, meaning that probably that pawn is just a pawn, and I will be able to win the game if I just play normal looking moves, or, or you know, I, I keep control of the things, then, then yeah, I, I would win the game. So after that, I also have a third option, which is usually taking back or giving back whatever material you had in order to develop your own pieces. In this case, I think the equivalent to that would be castling. And after c takes d4, white does get back the pawn. But after something like d5, I have easy development. Um, I'm a little bit... Um, I think this is a little bit dubious from white. That's what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to take that pawn. I'm not going to believe what what white is doing now knight d5 is a big threat because if i castle for example knight d5 knight f6 is a threat all of a sudden f6 maybe uh, maybe i don't want to play that maybe i don't have any choice i will end up doing that knight d5 i think f6 and i'm doing well i'm not losing which is good always good and once again i'm just trying to finish my development white has what we call initiative or that pawn that I that I just snatched from them. If I play, nor if White plays normal looking moves, White will eventually lose because well, White is just down a pawn and a pawn is a pawn. So White has to do something quite energetic. Now H3 doesn't seem to be a very energetic move. I think this is a mistake by my opponent. How do we make the most of that mistake? That's another question. I think I'm going to start with h6, asking a question, where is this bishop going to go? He's going to go to h4, trying to, well, potentially getting a little bit trapped, or bishop e3, trying to double and create a battery against h6. Going to h4. Here I have to play g5. If not, knight d5 is a little bit uh, annoying. If I play d6, for example, knight d5, threat is bishop takes e6, so I have to do something about that, and f6 mm. is very weird. Maybe g5 there. Maybe I should have waited for white to go knight d5. That's something that I, I realized late. Either way, I'm playing d6. My opponent's playing bishop e3. I'm going to play bishop e6. We are down 
on the clock. And if you've watched this series of videos, Blitz Chess, um, I have 26 of them. This is the tw number 26th. You will realize that I'm not very good at managing my time. I'm going to play queen d7. I have 15 seconds left. I'm going to try to bring my rooks into the game. Something that I see happening all the time, especially in Blitz, Blitz, Blitz sorry, is that once my opponents realize what, what's going on, and what, what is going on is that I'm, I'm running out of time, they play quickly. Meaning that my time trouble is contagious. And if you're the one that has one minute and a half, and your opponent has 12 seconds, and you start playing quickly, then pretty much you're both playing with time trouble because, yeah. The moral of the story is don't, don't play for the time, play for, for the position. I'm going to play queen c8 to defend b7 and then knight e7 maybe. 95 is also an idea. A little bit more active than knight d7 actually. Knight e7, sorry. I'm going to... I'm going to try to... To not, uh, not lose, so give me, give me some time. Maybe 97 was better. I don't have time to speculate. Knight takes f3 is a threat, kind of. I'm gonna play c6 now. Queen b3, I think I have knight g4. I like this transformation. One, because I get rid of a knight that was coming to f5. And two, a queen takes g4 is a threat. Short term. Um, I'm gonna play b6 and c5. Oh, that's ugly. Should have not done this. Shouldn't have done this, I should say. Yeah, this is horrible. I'm gonna play c5, I guess. Okay. I was going to play c5, pretty much whatever. Either way. So I'm happy that white did not go rook e c2. I think that was pretty annoying. I'm gonna try to go queen b7 and d5. That's my only hope. But if that's not possible, then that's gonna be a problem. Okay, bishop e5 now. Trying to get d takes e5, of course. Bishop takes g3 is an idea. Okay, now I'm absolutely fine. Yeah, I was, I was quite worried about my position there for a second. But now I think I'm back to back to business. I'm going to create a battery here. I'm going to try to triple Aliehin's gun. Maybe h5. Okay, I'm going to go put king g7. Rook h8. Flirt with the idea of h5. This is the part of the game in which, you know, everyone's going for, for an attack. Because it's time trouble, so whoever creates an attack first or creates threats quicker wins, ultimately. I'm gonna do this, threaten rook d h6. Opponent doesn't do anything about that. I guess king f2, but g4. g3 is a threat. Is it? Queen e7? I'm gonna play queen e7, I think that's a real threat. g takes f3? I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna go rook f6 is possible. Rook g5. Rook f3, I take. Do I? I think so. I can't believe my opponent is still hanging on. Queen g3 may have been better there. I'm playing very poorly. I'm gonna go queen f4. If this rook. Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm hallucinating. I thought my rook was on g6. That's good. That's not good, sorry. Yeah, now, now things are unclear. Wait, queen h2 was interesting? Oh, now it, I'm winning. Yeah. Because of rook d6. And queen c2. And queen a4. And queen b5. Rook c3. Queen a4. Oh, this is mate. There we go. Oh my goodness. So, the last stage of this video is usually going for a quick analysis. When you're playing a game, you want to locate where the critical moments were. So, in this case, I think the crit critical moment was one part of the opening in which White already decides to sacrifice a pawn. White has to make this decision. In, this is a serious decision. If you don't have enough compensation, sorry, for the pawn. Then you will ultimately lose, which is what happened in the game. Um, but the second critical moment, probably around this position, because here I went b6, which is a very big mistake, I'm, I'm assuming. 
Uh, I think it just weakens c6 quite a lot. So after something like rook e c2, I would be in trouble. Um, I would have to push c5 either way, and queen takes b6 is actually there. That's why queen c4. Now I can play c5 because queen takes b6 is not. So everything is very concrete. That's what, what chess is about. about. So I think those are the two critical moments. But other than that, nothing, nothing too crazy. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, any suggestions, please let me know in the comment section below. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying making these videos. I hope you're enjoying and learning from them. Please let me know as well. And yeah, subscribe or give a like. I would really appreciate it. Sorry, uh, watch another video. I mean, give a like as well. Um, I would really appreciate it. And I will see you next time. Have a nice day.